He is the skipper of the Oakland Athletics, Bob Melvin, here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Bob? I'm good. Yourself? Were you the one who called security on us that night? You know what? This is news to me. I had had no idea about this. Usually I hear about things like that, but uh, didn't get to me, so you shouldn't, you probably weren't. causing that much commotion okay good good because we thought that we were a little loud we heard the a's were were in the in the hotel and that they were complaining so um unfortunately that puts a little takes a little wind out of our sails we were trying to take a little bit of credit here for your success well i you know what I, every little bit helps so okay. i'll give you some credit so let's thank you i appreciate that that's all i was looking for uh so six consecutive wins here uh, bob just in the short term and and then just a an incredible uh, I guess coming together team wise and just every phase of the game to what do you owe uh, what is happening this season? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, 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 we felt like we had a, a good group coming into spring training last year. You know, we played well the last couple months of the season. Some of our high profile prospects came up and, and had some success, which, you know, lends to some confidence going into the season. And then, you know, just at one point, everything came together. Uh, certainly our bullpen uh, is a big part of it. You know, Lou Trevino coming up and doing what he's done. Obviously, Blake trying in at the back end of the bullpen. You know, and then adding some pieces along the way, whether it's from development and, and or guys like Jerry's Familia. Um, you know, just everything seems to be coming together. And I think the fact that everybody is part of it, you know, all 25 guys really, guys in the minor leagues like Frankie Montas and Daniel Mangden, and, and, you know, it's more than 25. So that can be a powerful thing when everybody feels like they're part of it. Well, in terms of powerful things, too, um, uh, a player who gained a little bit of a national uh, spotlight for you, Bob, because of what was going on with his mom is Steve Piscotti, who came to the team uh, last year uh, from St. Louis because uh, his mom uh, was stricken with ALS and he wanted to be around her and she passed away he he singles when he comes back when he comes back and in the homers when he's back after grieving I mean what has it been like to be around him yeah that's a pretty surreal story and you know guy that grew up in the Bay Area was an Oakland A's fan as a kid um, to be able to come back here and then spend what was a difficult few months with his mom and be there every day I know was really important to him and you know now he's just kind of settling back into his game here the last couple of months, which is which is a pretty good brand of baseball that he plays. And you know I think he'll tell you he's got quite the angel on his shoulder right now too. So you know there are a lot of good stories uh, that that pertain to what's going on with right right now. But I don't know that it won't any better than Stephen Piscotti. Well, what did uh, what did the team glean from him? Just watching him uh, and watching him work while what was going on in his personal life was unfolding. Well, yeah, they knew the story before he even got here, and then, you know, obviously being a part of it with the clubhouse every day, and <clears throat> he's, uh, you know, he's become a big personality with us, too. And, you know, the home run, I think, that he hit when he came back from uh, his mom's funeral in Boston in his first at bat just really electrified our dugout and, you know, really, uh, you know, kind of, put this whole process that he's had to go through kind of at a different level. And like I said, now he's just settled into playing like baseball, like he plays. And, you know, he's a big part of the success. Bob Melvin, athletics manager here on the Rich Eisen Show. Where does Chris Davis rank amongst home run hitters that you've been around playing? I, you know, based on the fact that he's on his way to hitting 40 home runs for the third year in a row in Oakland and, uh, you know, guys like Canseco and McGuire have, have not done that here. Our ballpark's difficult to hit home runs in, especially yeah. at night. And for him to, to do it in the consistent fashion he has since he's been here puts him right at the top with anybody I've ever had. And so um, what, what does he mean for this lineup, Bob? He, he's the force in the middle of it that, you know, is consistently there. And, and, you know, we have some nice parts around it. Certainly Jed Lowry had a terrific first half, made the – all-star team for the first time in his career, uh, you know, in the three-hole, and and you really kind of between the two of those guys carried us early on, and now everybody's kind of filling in, you know, up and down the lineup where, you know, we feel like we're a deep line to have a chance to score every inning. So, but Chris is kind of that mainstay in the middle that's always one swing away from three runs. Well, I mean, the I guess a, a sense of a lot of folks outside looking in, Bob, is that you're you're playing with not a full deck compared to the rest of big market teams because of the economics of of baseball and the athletic situation in general would you agree with that assessment well you know i mean 
it's documented. I think we're last in payroll going into the season. I know where we sit right now. We've we've added a few guys, but uh, typically that doesn't happen very often. But we do also have some some really good young players that really aren't making any money yet. You know, as far as baseball is concerned. I mean, relative to the to the real world, obviously, but. Um, so I think you know that allows us to to have some success that that maybe did, people didn't see early on, but I don't think it's a surprise to us anymore. We're you know we're just trying to go out there and play the best we can and on a particular day and try to win. And based on the fact that we've had a nice little run, there's some confidence that goes along with it. If baseball passed a rule saying that infielders had to have, have at least one foot on the dirt uh, to try and uh, I guess release the grip of shifting, would you agree with that? Bob Melvin. I don't. I mean, it's yeah. I, I'm I'm a bit of a baseball traditionalist, but this isn't the first time we've seen shifts. I mean, I grew up in in the Bay Area here when Willie McCovey was getting shifted way back when, and Ted Williams, and you know, it's it's you know, there's certain things I might look to change, but that, I don't know that that's one of them because what you're doing is you're trying to put your guys in the best spot to to, to create outs and. You know, there's there's different ways to to try to combat that. Hit the ball the other way, maybe bunt to try to get the shift moved over for you. So that that's one that I probably wouldn't be for. But in this day and age now, I mean, will will when you're pointing out about Ted and Willie McCovey, uh, there was really no such thing as as exit speed and all the other aspects of analytics that's put into play here, Bob. It just seems that half the game you're either watching a walk, a strikeout, or a home run. And and there there is a concern about that, at least in terms of watchability. Right? Correct, but I don't think that you know a walk or, or a strikeout or a home run plays necessarily into the shifts. I mean, I think it's almost now where you're seeing four outfielders, you know, with the with the infielder out in the outfield almost. And I think it comes a day where maybe there is a fourth outfielder, literally, and and you know, not as many infielders, but. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it is what it is right now, and, and there, like I said, there's ways to combat it, and, and you know, it it's probably swings back the other way if guys look to do that. What about the advent, uh, Bob, of, of, of starting closers that we're beginning to see a little bit more in baseball? What, what do you think of that advent that we're seeing? I think that's based on the personnel you have, and, you know, if, if you have – you know, you look at the run. Tampa's a pretty creative group, and, and they're looking at the amount of runs that are given up in the first inning, and that typically is the time that you can get to a starter is a little bit more vulnerable early on, and now you're bringing in a reliever that's used to pitching one inning. Um, if you have, you're looking at Houston Astros, I, I don't think they really need to do that. They have five starters that go out there and have a chance, you know, to go deep into games every time. Um, I think it's more the personnel that they have and trying to maximize what they can do over there. So, um, you know, I, it's not something I think we need to do right now, but, but I, I think they're smart in, in trying to, to work it that way based on their personnel. Well, Bob, a couple more minutes left with you here. You just swept the Tigers. You're one six in a row. You just came from Detroit where you broke in uh, to the big leagues in the, in the mid eighties. Do you have any Sparky Anderson in you? Anybody that you have uh, from your playing days that you, you put into you're managing where, again, you've won manager of the year in both leagues, only one of seven guys to ever do such a thing. What do you well, yeah, I try to take a little bit of, of, you know, everybody I've been around as far as managers go and, and players as well. I came up in that system, and when you come up in, in a system, make it to the big leagues, it's really like kind of a university. You know, you're freshman, then you're sophomore, you finally make it to varsity. I came up behind guys like Kirk Gibson and Alan Trammell and Jack Morris and and Lance Parrish and Lou Whitaker and got to watch them firsthand and see how they played the game. So they're very impactful my, in my career. Kirk Gibson was just here announcing he's been a good friend of mine and took care of me as a rookie. But I try to take little bits and pieces of, of every team I've been on and every manager I've played for, good and bad. So, um, But the Tigers are, are definitely a team that, that mm-hmm. probably – you know, resonates as much as any based on the fact I came up with them. Who's the best player you ever played with, Bob? Uh, that's a tough question. Played with, um, man, there, there are a lot of really good ones. I, you know, how can you go wrong with Cal Ripken and, hmm. and what he did in Baltimore? You know, maybe, maybe not the, you know, the streak and, and what he brought to the table every single day. He took batting practice every day. He took infield every day, and he played in every inning, every game. 
Uh, that's a pretty good one to start with. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome one to start with. Okay, so do you talk to your team about what's developing? I mean, how do you how do you address the the success that you've had so far to maintain it? How do you do that with your team, Bob? You, you know what? I Dodgers? try to stay pretty consistent, and when we have advanced meetings, uh, you know, every if they start every series, I kind of add a little something. There's certain times during the year when then maybe you need to address some things. There haven't been that many this year, so I just try to, you know, stay consistent in, you know, what happened the series before and, and you know, kind of what we need to do in this series. And, you know, our clubhouse, for a mostly younger group of guys, is pretty well policed, and we have some veteran guys in there that, that know how to run a clubhouse. So um, you, you just kind of take it series to series and when you think you need to be impactful with what you need to say. And, and uh, you've got right across the street from you there in that stadium uh, a dynastic team in the NBA. Have you uh, had any relationship with the Warriors at all, Bob? Anybody, any, I guess, other than Draymond Green coming to one of your games during the finals a couple of years ago? I mean, Yeah, we were aware of that. No, I, you know what? <laughs> I grew up here watching the Warriors since I was a young kid and going to those games. And my godfather was actually Dick DeLiva, who was the trainer for the Warriors for a oh, long, God. long time back in the championship 75 wow. so I, I was able to to become a fan early on and and certainly now as well i know steve a little bit steve kerr lives up you know has lived up the street from me for a while since he's been here too and you know to be able to to kind of watch what they're doing and and you know next door and and you know kind of try to take some of that vibe that uh, that they have and the championships that they have. It's it's an, it's a nice neighbor to have, put it that way. So you knew Draymond Green was in the house that night? We did. We knew he was coming that night. Uh, <laughs> I kind of made a joke and said if he wants to hang out in my office, he's more than more than happy, but I think probably a suite's a little better place to, yeah. place to be. With Marshawn Lynch, too, if I'm not mistaken. That's that what night. I understand, yeah. he went. I went to Cal, and so, you know, <laughs> the, the Lynch factor and the Look Bay Area you. factor here, there, there's a lot of that. So cause we'll start talking about Melvin Quakes very soon. We'll start talking yeah, about well, that. Yeah, well, I don't know about that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it's great to see what's happening right there. It's been a lot of fun to watch, and uh, good luck down the line. We'll chat again soon, hopefully. Thank you. I appreciate it. You bet. That's Bob Melvin of the Oakland Athletics. Hey, he going back to the Rick Barry years, barring a cup of sugar from Steve Kerr up the street. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.